good morning. Welcome, everyone. And we have Will Chan here this morning with us. So a little bit about the sanitation districts. Um, we've been around since the 1920s, and we have two major functions. We handle wastewater for over half of LA County. We treat about 400 million gallons of wastewater a day. Um, that's enough to fill the Rose Bowl. We also manage about a fourth of LA County's solid waste, trash. Um, and so those two parts of our agency, wastewater and solid waste, make us uniquely positioned to help with the food waste um, issues we're dealing with in the state. So let's get into it. So LA County generates 21 million tons of waste per year. And of that waste, 9 million gets buried in landfills each year. And of that line, the landfill waste, about a third of that is organic, food waste, landscaping stuff, pruning stuff. And that, and of that organic material, about 4,000 of that, 4,000 tons of that, or half of the organic waste is food waste. And that food waste, every day we throw that out. Um, and if it's disposed in a landfill, it re releases methane to the environment. And methane is a greenhouse gas 23 times more disruptive than CO2. Um, and when you look at some of the latest research, uh, green food waste being disposed of, organic waste being disposed of, creates about 6% of the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So California has been pretty aggressive about bringing, um, diverting organics of landfills part of their whole climate change initiative. So there are two major laws. Um, uh, legislation that became laws, AB 1826, it requires mandatory commercial organics uh, recycling for um, companies that produce a certain amount of um, food waste or organic uh, material per week. So initially it was four uh, cubic yards per week required to have a mandatory organics recycling where you composted it or you di uh, anaerobically digest it, where you took it out of the landfill and you put it in a vessel so no methane could have um, released the atmosphere. But recently, that four, th four cubic yards per week threshold got lowered because California is pretty serious about pulling organic material, food waste out of our waste stream. And other laws, SB 1383, that requires by, or it has goals or targets. And by January of this year, we were supposed to reduce the organic waste being landfilled by 50%. That's 50% of our 2014 levels. And then by 2025, uh, reduce it by 75%. Should be 75% of our 2014 organic waste level that were being landfilled. And, you know, and these laws, um, the state will start implementing or enforcing them um, the beginning of 2022. So the sanitation districts, we have our food waste to energy program that can help cities and businesses meet these requirements, this organics requirement. And on our left, you see our Pointy Hills material recovery facility. This is a cornerstone of our solid waste management facilities. Um, we can take food waste there, among other types of waste, and we can process that. And then at our largest wastewater treatment plant in Carson, we call the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant, we have digesters, which allow us to put that food waste in there and capture that methane without any of it going into the atmosphere. So our program has several steps. I'll give you an overview of it, and then we'll dive into it more. The first step is we need source separated food waste and then we process that into a slurry or a smoothie type thing. And we usually do that at our material recovery facility. Then the second step, we take that slurry and we take it to our joint plant in Carson and we put it into those anaerobic digesters, which are set up just like our stomach, same type of micro microorganisms in our gut they, they consume, they use that food waste and wastewater solid and they generate biogas, which is mainly methane and CO2. And we take that methane and we use it as an energy supply, a fuel source. And then the last step in our process is the solids that get pulled out of the digester after 15, 16 days. We try to recycle that, we compost it, we can turn it into fertilizer. 
and just consistent with what we try to do in terms of converting waste into a resource. And here, um, I'm going to give uh, Genesis some opportunities if there are any questions. We want to make this like a real tour, so if people have questions as we go along, they can raise their hand or in the chat. Genesis, are there any questions before I move ahead? And nothing pertaining to what you just said, so we'll cover okay. it. All right, great. Thank you. So here's what source separated food waste looks like. So when you go to your local local bonds or rouse or superior, in the back, there most likely is a bin that source separated food waste goes in. Um, like the tomatoes that may be a little too ripe or old, you know, the carrots aren't good, the celery, whatever. It all goes in there because we want as clean or pure food waste as possible so we um, get the best energy content from it. That source separated food waste is then brought to our Point of Hills material recovery facility. Here's a shot on the left of the entrance of the material recovery facility. And what would happen is the truck would come in, would be weighed. They would pay typically $70 a ton for that food waste. If you enter into long-term contracts with us, we can, there could even be a discount on that tonnage rate. Once you, um, once you pay your fee, you drive into an enclosed building and we just want to give you that virtual feeling of what it's like to drive into the Pointy Hills Merv. This facility came online in 2005. It's quite large. It could fit three jumbo jets in there and we're trying to pull out uh, anything that has value. You see in the left, you have recycled material that's been pulled out. Um, and as we go into this fully enclosed building, look to the right, that's where we do our food waste recycling to energy, right where my cursor is at. And here's an aerial shot of it. Every day, the Point of Hills Murph uh, material recovery facility gets about three to 30 tons of food waste per day, and we turn that into a slurry. So here's, um, we're gonna step you, th step you through how that gets turned into a slurry. This is, this is video shot in 2018 when our program came online. We were in demonstration phase in 2014, working with waste management to perfect this and look at the energy content of the food waste. And after that, this was the auspicious day. There should be music for this when we started our food waste energy program. Food waste is put into a hopper. And then it will go into what we call a bio separator. They flip the switch. The auger will move the source separated food waste and even source separated food waste has quite a bit of contaminants in it. So it's being pushed into our first bioseparator. And what that's doing is basically pulverizing everything, mixing it with water. The first thing are the rejects, plastics and all that stuff that's inorganic. It's not, um, that isn't a fuel supply for us. Then the food waste slurry goes to the next step where you're removing finer plastics. And, and all that reject gets landfilled, the plastic. And then you're left with this slurry. This is basically the food waste that's been mixed and we created our own smoothie, this high energy smoothie. So there's a still of the, the our, what we call our Dota system. So here's your hopper, here's your first bio separator, your second bio separator, and back over here where my cursor's at is our water tanks. As we make our smoothie, we add water from, every smoothie needs water. We add water to the food waste, and then that slurry is stored in these three tanks. And then we have an operator, a truck driver will, off, will fill his tanker. Notice in his hand, he has a little container. That's a sample of the food waste. We, we collect a sample with each shipment so we can test it for its energy content and so on, pH level. And then that that slurry is then trucked to our joint water pollution control plant in Carson. And here's a shot of our receiving station where that's offloaded. Um, slurried food waste that is offloaded there, usually we charge $25 a ton. Once it's offloaded into receiving station, then we put it into our digester and we're looking to get gas. Uh, we're going to generate gas. So we're going to show you an aerial shot 
We have about 24 digesters at the joint plant in Carson. This is where the solids from wastewater treatment are settled out and put in. And these are set up like our gut, like our tummy. And you see little shots of microorganisms that live in those digesters in this anaerobic or oxygen free environment. And the mixture of food waste and wastewater solids is their food supply and they generate methane. And then just a, a side note, about 9% of the volume that we might put in a digester by volume is food waste. So these microorganisms consume that material and give you an idea how big these digesters are. If you notice this board right here, that's about six feet in height. So these digesters are about 50 feet in height, 10 feet above ground and about 40 feet below ground, producing gas anaerobically, oxygen free, what they call in vessel composting, where it's completely sealed, no methane escaping to the atmosphere. We take that biogas, which is mainly methane and CO2, we run it through a first an engine that uses the biogas to generate power. We have a, like three of these engines, a jet type engines at the joint plant in Carson. Then the heat exhaust from that, we use that to turn a steam turbine that generates additional power. And the bottom line, we have a power plant at our largest wastewater treatment plant that runs on this biogas. This plant generates 20 megawatts of power, enough for 20,000 homes and essentially makes that treatment plant, which, is, which treats about 260 million gallons of sewage a day, 260 million gallons of sewage a day, it makes it essentially energy self-sufficient. And I say essentially, because there will be times during the year where we have to take down the power plant for maintenance. So with us getting more and more food waste and with these California laws coming down the pipe, mandating that organics and food waste have to be um, pulled out of the landfill, we're getting more and more food waste. So we're starting to produce more biogas than our power plant that we call the total energy facility can handle. So what we've done, and Will can talk more about that as we get into the Q&A, what we've done is from the digester, we've built, we've built a pipeline and you follow in the path of the drone. Um, this is Figueroa Street. And we're going uh, north and Figaro under the street, and we're going to pipe our renewable natural gas to a fueling station we already have there. We have a fueling station on our district's property that uh, people can buy compressed natural gas out of the, uh, the natural gas pipeline in that area. But what we're going to do is take the digester gas, the biogas, we're going to bring it here to what we call a bio, uh, biogas conditioning system. We're gonna purify that gas, store it in this tanker, and then wean ourselves off the natural gas in the pipeline and use the biogas for the vehicles that are here. So let's come down from our drone shot. Here's what the biogas conditioning system looks like. And let's just kind of give you a schematic. Uh, we're a lot of engineers here. We love schematics. So the biogas comes in, remove the moisture in there. We remove the, the next step is to remove contaminants like sulfur compounds. And then it goes through a membrane that removes the, the CO2. So basically you go from 62% methane to 90% uh, methane, and then that's vehicle fuel. We store it in this tanker that's pressurized, and then we will be using it at our existing fueling station. You can see our partners in this clean energy, but by November, we should be able, we should pipe all the, the renewable natural gas will replace um, the, the natural gas from the local pipeline at this fueling station. So the last step, well, uh, let me take a break here. Genesis, are there any questions? Yeah, um, so you mentioned wastewater solids a little earlier. Can you explain to us what wastewater solids are? So basically, you know, sewage comes in and the solid material that gets settled out in, what we, in, the, in the wastewater process is some of the microorganisms that are settled out. Um, those are mainly organic in nature and we put them in the digester and they're also broken down anaerobically. And and so in those digesters, we co-mingle wastewater solids with the um, food waste slurry and the microorganisms are very happy with that food supply. 
And that energy that we produce, how much exactly is 20 megawatts per day? That's enough for 20,000 homes. Okay, great. And then before, a, a few slides earlier, you mentioned how when you go in and you have a ton of food waste, um, you have to pay a certain charge per ton. So who exactly is paying that? And yeah, first question is who exactly is paying that? Okay, first so a haulers, um, when if you, anyone can come to our facility, but when you come there as a hauler, you would pay that fee. If you're bringing um, unprocessed food waste, you would pay $70 a ton. And the, the Pointe Hills Material Recovery Facility, it, like I, I mentioned earlier, is taking about 30 tons per day of food waste. We could process another probably five times as much. So there's more capacity there. But if someone wants to bring food waste slurry, so jump the first step and bring food waste slurry straight to the joint plant, we can take, um, that's about $25 a ton for that food waste slurry. That's the food waste that's been converted into a smoothie. Okay, and you mentioned two different prices. First, you talked about a $70 per ton at the Pointe Hills Murph, and you also mentioned a $25 per ton at the JWPCP. Yes. So what's the difference between the two? So the $75 a ton is um, just food waste. Let's say it comes from Ralph's, the back of just, it's a bunch of tomatoes and carrots and it hasn't been converted into a slurry. That's $70 a ton. But if you convert it to a slurry and you bring it there, but it takes a lot of infrastructure to get it there. One of the unique things about it is we already have the infrastructure in place. If you convert it into a smoothie and you bring it right to the second step, if you look right here on this second step. So if you come in here, first step, that's $70 a ton. If you come in here at the second step, and it takes a whole boatload of infrastructure like the Dota system we saw, uh, then you're looking at $25 a ton. Okay, uh, sounds great. And I think just one other question that, that's kind of covered in the beginning. So how does a resident's food waste get sorted out? So if someone has lettuce or spoiled chicken, can they drive up to the MRF to, to get rid of it? Or uh, will the hauler get rid of it for them? Yeah, um, Will could chime in at some point, but what it, it's, con it's incumbent on your hauler and your city to put together a program. The cities um, and businesses are gonna be, are under this crunch to divert it. So what we do is we accept what people bring. We don't collect waste. But we, I, but you can bring it to us. It's really working with your city. Your city might have a food waste diversion program or your hauler. Will, is there anything you'd want to add to that? And then the other thing, just to clarify, is for if you if you have food waste slurry, you can't just show up at the joint plant. You have to contact us first to to make an appointment so that. Uh, and the person you want to talk to is Will Chen. That's why he's here. So if you have food waste slurry, he's your man. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I think you covered most of it, Basil. But you know, anyone's open to the public to bring to the MRF. Um, for the joint plant slurry, you do have to meet our specifications, which we can kind of dive into a little bit later. But it does need to meet um, our specification, which has 29 different parameters um, to meet, including pH, conductivity, contamination. So if you do um, intend to bring us slurry, it does have to meet those specifications first before we can allow it into our digesters. Okay, so I think we can move on for now. There are other questions that we can answer as we go along. All right, thank you, Genesis. Um, all right, so the last step is the stuff that gets pulled out of the digest, the solids, right? It's been the stuff, the food waste, the wastewater solids, microorganisms had a feast in there, there's stuff that's left over. That gets pulled out here, and we're, then we're trying to turn that into soil amendment or compost. So that digested solid is dewatered using a centrifuge, that's what you see in this image. And again, we love little schematics. And basically what this does, it takes the, di the digested solid, it's spun in the centrifuge, the heavier stuff goes on the perimeter and the water comes out the middle. So you go from something that's pretty essentially water will re greatly reduce the water content. And that, when it comes out of centrifuge, we have this biosolids cake. We call it cake because it looks like chocolate cake. 
and this is the good stuff. This is what it looks like after it's been dewatered. It's been digested in the anaerobic digester or in vessel um, anaerobic digester, and then it's dewatered. And then we buy that biosolids is, is truck to reuse facilities. We have about seven reuse facilities for biosolids. We want to make sure we don't put all our eggs in one basket. But most of our biosolids, um, a lot of our biosolids, is composted with ag waste to create a soil amendment. So those are the kind of three major steps in our food waste energy program. So where are we at? So at the joint plant, we're doing about 300 tons per day of food waste coming in. And again, Will is your man if you have food waste slurry. You can see back in 2014, this is our demonstration phase. But then we went, we, we got, Will got, and, and all the folks that work with Will and the energy recovery group, they were ready to go. They implemented their DOTA system in 2018. You can see the curve starts picking up. And then we even get a little bit of uh, a dip because of you know all the stuff that's happened to our economy because of COVID. But we're at about 300 tons per day of food waste slurry coming in. In addition to the Pointing Hills Merc, we have about eight other haulers that have availed themselves of this existing infrastructure and this, you know, the synergy we can we can provide. And we're hoping to go to about 600 tons of food waste slurry a day. That's, I mean, Will can get more into that. And if we can, right now, at 300 tons of food waste slurry a day, we're generating the energy equivalent of 2,000 gallons of gasoline. We're not generating gasoline. We're generating compressed natural gas or renewable natural gas. But the energy equivalent is about 2,000 gallons of gasoline a day, which is amazing considering this is something that was creating an issue in our environment. And if we get up to 600, when we, not if, we will get up to 600, uh, we're gonna produce about 5,700 gallons, gasoline gallons equivalent of energy a day. And as we start ramping up as more and more food waste and food waste slurry come to us, we're still gonna produce electricity, vehicle fuel, like I said, we're, that's coming in line. Uh, we can talk more about that in by November the latest. That fueling station will be running completely on renewable natural gas. But as we get more and more food waste, we'll explore other options, other uses for this one, this energy, this renewable energy. And one of them would even be looking at injecting it into the natural gas pipeline. In a um, uh, plug, if you have food source separated food waste, Abib Karat is your guy, and we'll make sure that's his information. So he's um, at the material recovery facility, Pointy Hills Material Recovery Facility. And if you have food waste slurry, Will Chan is your person if you want to um, explore how to bring that or how to get it to our facility. So that's what I have. Um, any questions? Uh, Genesis, should I stop sharing? We have uh, quite a few. So I hope they're all for Will. <laughs> all right. So the first one we'll go with. Um, can the power generation be timed for the summer demand times of the day? Or is there an excess that goes back to the grid? Will, do you want to take that? I mean, our excess we put in the grid. Uh, but Will, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the power plant, uh, the power plant total energy facility, its main primary purpose is really to self supply all of its energy demands. Um, you know, we are getting to a point where we are receiving more and more food waste, which is in turn generating more gas and it does go out onto the grid. But again, it's it's primarily um, used, you know, to power to satisfy the power needs of the uh, joint plant. So we have the capability, but like my, uh, Basil mentioned before, you know, we intend to use that extra biogas for renewable natural gas as vehicle fuel for our first phase. Okay. And uh, Basil, you mentioned compost. Is there a place where people can pick up some of that compost? Um, no. So the compost, we, we have remote sites where we, we generate the compost and we, lurk, we work with farmers in that area or Inland Empire, maybe you could go there and pick up compost. We have an Inland Empire compost facility. Yeah, you could pick up compost there, I would, I would say. But it's, it's, it's out in Rancho Cucamonga. And would you know if someone wanted to compost on their own without buying all this high-tech equipment? 
could they do it? I'm not a composting expert, but we have uh, we have a, a, a recycling coordinator who, yeah, you can compost on your own in your backyard and so on. What happens to all the methane that comes from breaking down the food waste? Could you remind so me? What makes our food waste program, food waste energy program, so incredible, so great, is that it's all captured in those digesters, and the energy recovery group, um, the energy group, they convert that into energy, so it's all captured from the digest, it's completely sealed, as opposed to if it's in a <coughs> landfill, some of it might escape to that. Can people put their food waste into their yard waste barrel or are those two completely different things? Um, those are, I mean, that wouldn't help us in terms of food waste to um, energy program. Um, and I see those as, as completely different things. Uh, well, is there anything you'd want to add? Yeah, you know, those programs really depend on your hauling uh, company. Like Basil mentioned, our Dota facility is really meant to accept only source separated food waste. If we start commingling, you know, municipal solid waste, residential waste, it makes the you know separation that much harder. The equipment that's required is, is going to be have to be designed differently. Um, but I think it's going to be inevitable that we start doing that in the near future. But for now, our equipment at the MRF is not um, set up to be able to handle you know, residential and municipal solid waste with the organics mixed in. And when you guys talk about source separated food waste, what exactly does that mean? Basically, you have a designated bin for food waste, you know, let's like say at a restaurant, you don't put other types of waste in there. It's just food waste, whether it be, um, you know, carrots, vegetables, yeah, but it's just food Ways. Yeah, and it's primarily it's before consumers. So, you know, if you kind of look back at the picture of the food stock that we received at the Dota, it's definitely, um, you know, primarily, you know, food waste. It's before the consumer gets to use it. So the forks and the wrappers, it's really not too prevalent. Um, however, there is still contaminants and that's what the bioseparators are used for. And we typically remove as much of the larger pieces, you know, like the boxes and the large pieces of plastic as much as possible. But still, you know, inevitably you still get contamination in, but the whole purpose is really to cut down on the contamination because think of it as, as you know, if there are any pieces of glass or um, plastic that ends up going, making it past and into the smoothie, and we end up uh, sending it over to the Joint Water Pollution Control Plants and our digesters, that stuff does not break down at all. And so, um, you know, over the course of five or six years, which is the time in between we take our digesters down for cleaning, that stuff really has to get manually removed. So if we can at all possible, you know, remove as much of that inorganic inerts um, on the front end, uh, that's our goal. Thanks, and I, I think you answered a couple of other questions with that. Um, and referring to that, how exactly is the plastic mechanically separated from the food waste? So, so the bioseparators, I mean, there's two phases, two stages. The first stage has um, basically 13 millimeter holes. And as the food waste comes in, there's a hammer mill that essentially squeezes the organic fraction out through those holes. Think of it as almost like a garlic press or a sieve. And so by that first process, we removed close to 75% of most of the larger pieces like the, the plastic wrappers, the glass, and that gets basically uh, landfilled or retained out. Um, on the second phase, the opening size, uh, you know, is, is, is decreased to about eight millimeters. And so the contaminants that make it through um, the first stage are hopefully removed in the second phase. And we have the ability to take all the rejects from the second phase run it through the system completely again so that we can actually extract most uh, of the organic fraction out. Now, depending on the food stock, uh, feedstock that comes in, sometimes, you know, Basil mentioned that we have water that is needed to dilute um, <clears throat> uh, to make the slurry, but sometimes it really depends on the feedstock. If we have, you know, a bunch of tomatoes coming in, which is relatively wet, we may or may not need that much water. Sometimes the feedstock that comes in is already pretty high in liquid, so you know, as long as we can meet our specification, which is about 13 to 15% solids, um, that can constitute as the uh, thickness of the slurry. Now, if we really wanted to, and it's too not, you know, liquid enough for us to pump into the tanker trucks, 
then we have the ability to either add our water um, that's produced from our water reclamation plant um, or from any of the liquids that's still collected on the floor of the MERV to get recycled back in. So we try to make it as, as green as possible to not use uh, any other additional resources um, if necessary. Okay, great. Um, so how much energy is produced from the food waste versus the energy that's produced from the sewage that we process? Well, you know, we're, <clears throat> You know, from our demonstration project and from the last couple of years that we've been running, um, we've determined that the food waste going into the digesters is a very, very efficient way of extracting still the energy inherent in the food waste. So, you know, for the stuff going into the anaerobic digesters, those particular digesters have actually doubled um, in their gas projection or the gas production. So, you know, we in order to make sure that the digesters health is not affected, which is absolutely paramount. We only co-digest 10% on a solids basis and 30% on a liquids basis um, inside of the digesters. So we're not completely overtaking and feeding the digesters with food waste. We're literally just kind of, uh, uh, you know, pushing a little bit at a time in to not affect the delicate biological process that's occurring. So with that little amount of food waste that's going in, we are able to double the gas production which kind of the metrics that Basil mentioned is, you know, if we're getting 300 tons per day and we're putting it into the digesters, that's enough, you know, digester gas and organic material to be converted into about 2,000 gas and gallon equivalents of um, energy or about 1.5 megawatts or about 15 to power enough homes, uh, 1,500 homes. So um, from the time that food waste arrives to the MERC, to the point where it's being pumped into your car, how long does that whole cycle take? You know, the, the I mean, we can kind of talk about it from, from you know, as the trucks come in, uh, once the trucks come into the MRF, they get weighed, um, they can drop their load. And that whole process really depending on traffic can take just a couple of minutes, uh, depending on how many people are at the scales and how busy it is. But it's a very simple process for customers to take our material, their material over to the MRF. Um, then on a daily basis, we have operators that take that organic food waste, put it into the dough machine, and that process gets run depending, again, depending on how much business we have, can be run a couple hours per day. Um, we have to coordinate deliveries um, between the Pointy Hills Murph dough machine and the joint plant. That's about a 30 mile uh, distance or a truck route. But sometimes we take one or two or three trucks per day between the Dota and the MRF, and that happens pretty much uh, within the same day. So let's say you bring a load um, of organic food waste to the MRF, that can be processed by the donut machine within a couple of hours, and then it'll make its 30 mile truck route down to JWPCP, where we can actually accept it pretty much immediately and dump it into either two locations, the sort of receiving facility or the Headworks LWDS, um, which we can kind of highlight um, as well. But as the organics uh, move into the anaerobic digester, you know, that organic fraction still needs to reside in those digesters for about 15, 16, 17, 18 days. And that's what we refer to as hydraulic retention time. And that's uh, basically required for all of the pathogens to be uh, destroyed. Um, so we wanna make sure that the bugs have adequate time to break that organic material down. And immediately once that organic material starts getting digested, uh, that chemical reaction changes it in, into methane immediately. So, so if you really want to say, you know, by the time you drop it off at the MERC down to joint plant to produce gas, it really could happen all within the same day. Okay, so within 24 hours? Cool. So the next question is, next question is, you talk about all this food waste and the source separated food waste are, for that edible food waste can, um, we donate it to people that need it? Um, part of what we, um, some of the legislation has a component where what cities and jurisdictions have to do is they have to work with food bank and try stuff that's edible to have it, you know, put to, you know, uh, feed um, people who are hungry and so on. Okay, um, and you talked about the legislation or do we have enough facilities and enough level of activity to meet the legislation's target by 2025? 
Do I answer that or will? Um, I would say you better get to our facilities um, and max them out. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not the expert. Will is more of an expert, but it doesn't seem we have enough facilities right now to handle all the food waste that needs to be diverted. Yeah. In. I mean, that, that's a great question, and that's a question that's on a lot of people's minds. Right now, like Basil mentioned in his earlier slides, in order for us to meet power cycles targets, that magic number is about 4,000 tons per day. And 4,000 tons per day, which was, you know, before all going to landfills, um, needs to be diverted out of that. And there really are only a couple of options of where that stuff can go, which is either composting or anaerobic digesting facilities or other recycling means, such as food rescues. So with our, you know, with all of our projects combined, our target goal for now is about 600 tons per day of food waste um, acceptance. So again, 600 out of 4,000 is, um, I mean, it's significant, but it's definitely not enough. So we really need a lot more infrastructure to be invested throughout the state in order to meet that 4,000, you know, capacity uh, to handle food waste diverted from the landfills. Okay, and um, this next question is for you, Basil. Can you explain a little bit more about what happens to all those materials at the processing center, the Point Hills MERV? Oh, you mean the rejects? Oh, oh the oh, um, the stuff that's um, we because yeah, we, we took a drive through the MERV. Oh, okay, the commodities we try to sell it, but that's also part of the story because of what's happened in terms of. Um, Usually our recycle been going to China, but China has been tougher in terms of the purity standard. So um, our recycle market kind of uh, become a, a lot tougher, but we try to recycle most of that stuff, sell that stuff. Um, okay. And at the MRF, you mentioned that when you're turning it into slurry, you have to use water. Where does that, where do we get that water from? Uh, well, could, um, so we either get it from uh, recycled water, and I think we'll mention there's also, we might have some liquids or fluids from, yeah. Yeah, it, it depends on the loads. I mean, we have a number of different options. Um, our, our priority is to utilize all the liquids that are generated and collected at the MERV. So as the food waste comes in, there's a lot of liquid that's, you know, on the floor. And we can basically recycle that and put it back into the tanks to dilute the uh, slurry. Um, the second option for us is to use reclaimed water that's directly produced by our water reclamation plant about a mile away at San Jose Creek. And then if none of those two sources are adequate to handle the requirements, then we can always use potable water as well. Okay. Um, so we have a, a question. Someone has their raised hand, Alix Demulin. Let's see. Could you, could you unmute yourself to ask your question? So, okay, never mind. So our next one is from Alston Tang. Alston Tang, did you want to ask your question? Uh, yes. So, um, so like you know how like in the refueling process, like you will find that um, we you will find that gas into like the renewable gas for like the pump. So, so when you talk about ninety percent methane, so what is the remaining ten percent about? Go ahead, well. Well, there's inevitably organics as well, or sorry, um, inorganic gases in there. It's primarily CO2. Um, and so there's different vehicle fuel standards, but we have designed our biogas conditioning system to meet um, California Code of Regulations standards for vehicle fuel. So by the time it leaves our biogas conditioning system, it goes into the renewable natural gas storage tank, it meets all the requirements to be considered fuel for a fueling station in the state of California. Okay. Great, thank you for your question, Austin. So, all right, so our next one is, um, what percentage of the plastic would you say ends up in that slurry? Um, so our specifications um, really are, are pretty tough in the sense that we do not, well, we wanna minimize as much as that um, Inerts, inerts that make it through the screening pre-processing facility as much or uh, processed as much as possible. So our specification for film plastics that are you know greater than four millimeters is really 0.4 percent. Um, then glass, which is greater than four millimeters, is also um, less than 0.5 percent by weight. So our specifications are very very tight, and it's really incumbent upon the haulers and the pre-processors to make 
to meet that specification. So again, it's a very, very small fraction. Um, the moment that you start introducing, you know, the glass and the plastic and that grit material, it does not get digested and someone's got to go in and remove that ultimately when we're cleaning out the digesters. And about how long will it take you to actually fill up um, each unit, each anaerobic digester that you have on site? Well, the, the digesters that we're using, we're co-digesting with, that are already in operation. Um, so basically, um, we, start code, we start feeding, you know, little bits of slurry at a time, and it takes, you know, a bit of time for us to slowly introduce our food waste slurry in. Sometimes it can take um, weeks at a time, and we'll start off with one truck per week, and then we'll slowly do the ramp up process where we can, you know, by the next week, we'll have two trucks delivering their food waste in the digesters, all while we're making sure that the digester is still performing healthily. So it's a bit of a process, but it takes a couple of weeks for us to ramp up to what the digesters can take on a maximum level. Okay, great. And those microbes in the digester, where do those come from? Uh, yeah, I mean, those are just, uh, we feed our anaerobic digesters with microorganisms that live anaerobically. I'm not, you know, we typically see them, but I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, you know, I guess it's almost like doing sour, sourdough. You get a, a colony of microorganisms, and when you go anaerobic, they kind of, kind of take over. Yeah, and they're just naturally occurring microorganisms that live in oxygen-free or oxygen-reduced environment. And so, for example, if waste management in Manhattan Beach was commingling their uh, organics with yard waste and the food waste, would that be going to your facility or no? It's strictly just food, no yard waste. You want to take that question, Will? So they're commingling yard waste with food waste. That wouldn't go to our facility. We're looking. Well, down down in Mount, I don't think so. Um, again, they would have to check with their local haulers to see where their you know material ends up being either landfilled or composted or die or recycled. Um, at this time, we're only taking source separated organics and food waste. So if you don't process food waste, who does? Well, there are other you know, avenues and other um, companies that are trying to develop and expanding their food waste program. Right. Like I mentioned before, everyone has their own kind of process. But if anyone is interested in taking it to our facility, as long as you meet the specification, um, then we'll be gladly uh, accepting as much of that material as you guys want to bring out. Sorry, I meant yard waste. So if question was, if you guys aren't processing the yard waste, then who is? Basil? Yeah, I would think that it depends on the hauler, but I would imagine that they would try to compost that, but I'm, I'm not. It depends on the hauler and the specific program. Um, we, do, um, we do process yard waste as a different stream, but it's, um, yeah, if, if it's clean, if it's clean and that. Yeah, it's primarily probably all going to composting. And that was a big challenge because of the recent Assembly Bill 1594. Um, typically before, you know, um, before January of this year, we were able to use um, green waste as our alternative daily cover for the landfill. Each day at the end of um, operation, you would typically have to cover all that uh, organic or that trash, what we call a cell with um, alternative daily cover to make sure that you know, there's not uh, odors or gases emanating from that live cell. But, but due to these new regulations, we can no longer consider the green waste that's used for ADC to be considered um, recycling. So that also has to be diverted away from landfills. Okay, and I think Habib wants to add to that. So Habib is our uh, division engineer in charge of the Point of Hills Materials Recovery Facility, so. And if you're looking to bring food waste to the berth, your guys. So thank you for joining us. Could you unmute yourself? There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Great presentation, by the way. Um, so yeah, I'd like to add that um, the MRFs uh, and the landfills do a process food waste, and they uh, are sent to composting facilities. So to answer the question that came in, it really depends on the city if they do allow food waste to be commingled with their green waste. 
because depending on when the where the green waste ends up and at which composting facilities, the composting facilities need to be permitted to also allow food waste with the green waste. Um, a lot of the composting facilities right now are permitted to process green waste. You know, they might allow a banana peel here and there, but if, uh, you know, larger amounts of food waste is commingled, commingled with the green waste, they might need to um, uh, get additional permits to allow that. So make sure that you check with your city uh, to see if that is allowable or not. Currently at our facilities uh, where we process green waste, um, the, uh, the composting facilities that we send to uh, do not allow food waste to be commingled with the green waste. Stay on the line, Abhi. I'm glad you tuned in. So someone's interested in that Oreo cake that we smelled. Uh, or <laughs> what does that smell like? They were interested in the Oreo cake, the biosolids. Uh, are these stations manned or is it mostly system controlled? Uh, re repeat that question. Are they the biosolids processing? Yeah. So one, yeah. what does that smell like? Two, are those stations manned or are they mostly system controlled? I, I, system controlled, I'd say. I still have personnel working there. But, um, and I think it smelled, it just smelled like, I don't know how to describe it. Um, how would you describe the smell? Nitro humus? I don't know. How would you describe the smell? Uh, I, I mean, kind of the digester, the odors are much reduced after 16, 17 days, but I don't know, I, I don't know how to describe what it, it smells a lot better than what went in. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, unless I walk inside the facility, you can't really. Right, there's, there's no odors uh, that come out of it, but if you were to be able to kind of see that cake up in person, I would describe it as just fertilizer. Um, you know, it's definitely got a little bit of a sour note to it, but it doesn't really <laughs> smell that bad. I mean, food waste definitely has a distinct uh, smell to it, but the fertilizer, at, at, you know, after it's been in the digesters for days, dewatered, you know, I, I don't think the, the smell is that bad, but I could be, you know, just being me, being in the industry for <laughs> almost 10 years, we smelled some pretty nasty stuff, and that's definitely not one of them. So Dennis has had it, what did it smell? You took a lot of the footage. What did you think of the smell? Again, I think maybe, I know that when you're outside, you don't really smell anything, but then when you walk in, like where I took that footage of the biosolids um, on the conveyor belt, it smelled at first, but then you quickly forget about it. You know, it's, I don't know how else to explain it. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, our next question is, did you guys want to take a sip of water or something? <laughs> People are excited, okay. which is great. I, I love it. So um, the next questions are, uh, so what kind of companies are taking this food waste to you? Um, like, so first, what kind of companies are taking the, the source separated food waste? And then we also have a question about those companies that are taking their slurry to you. Yeah, I, I can I can talk about the slurry first, but you know if you, if you want to take a look at that slide again, but we have eight different customers right now that are already um, under contract with us, and they have obviously already met their specification. They've been taking loads pretty consistently over to our joint plant. So, like the slide mentioned earlier, you know the the logos were displayed, but yeah, we have eight different companies that are already currently and have been bringing slurry to our joint water pollution control plant. Gotcha. So the next question, I'm just going to jump back to the biosolids real quick. Just, just to add to that, Genesis, so at the Pony Hills Material Recovery Facility, uh, just so that the audience understands, um, haulers have contracts with uh, local jurisdictions, the cities, you know, the county, uh, and as part of those contracts, uh, they are the ones that we're picking up the source-separated food waste uh, initially, what we're seeing is it's mostly from the commercial industry, uh, such as, you know, restaurants, uh, you know, uh, food warehouses, um, supermarkets. Uh, so those are the haulers uh, that you, um, for the most part, typically see if uh, that pick up at your residential will also pick up commercial. Some cities have separate haulers for commercial and residential, but in essence, uh, the haulers that come to us with the food waste are haulers uh, that are contracted with local jurisdictions to be able to pick up that material and bring to us. 
Okay, and let's, thank you, Habib. So let's backtrack just a little bit back to the biosolids because that was very interesting. Um, so are those biosolids, is that mixed in with the wastewater? Um, like, the biosolids, it's okay, it's the is solid. That waste with wastewater, I mean? Um, yeah, what you're looking at, some of that biosolids, it's, it can't tell the difference. After you mix the food waste slurry with the wastewater solids and it's broken down for 16 days, it looks like that chocolate cake. So you can't tell the difference. Okay. And we mentioned who, which companies bring the slurry, right? Yes. And so the next question, we have a few questions. They're interested in the new legislation that you were talking about. Um, so do you think we're going to, are we expecting more food waste as a result of SB 1383? Could you go more into detail about what SB 1383 uh, requires of, of uh, cities and waste haulers? I mean, basically you're trying to meet um, a 50% reduction in organic waste, 50% of the 2014 level by first of uh, January 1st of this year and then 75% reduction by 2025. And then enforcement actions are gonna start in the beginning of 2022. So yeah, I expect a lot more food waste to be brought to our facilities or have those facilities created because I think the state wants organics and food waste in particular out of the waste stream. They don't want it landfill. And how close do you think the state is in meeting that 50% reduction in food waste? Not even close, and that's why that I shouldn't, and well, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but you notice in one of the early slides, um, businesses had a four cubic yard per week threshold where they had to either digest or compost. They've lowered that to two cubic yards per week because I think when they evaluated how close we are to meeting that 50% threshold, we weren't close enough. Anything you want to add, Will? And do you, do you think that um, the yard waste will ever be part of this bioprocessing? And um, also if you're not taking in yard, or what are you using as your daily covers for the landfills? If you're not using yard waste? A beef and will can handle that. I mean, we're using dirt. I'm using um, biodegradable plastic film uh, that, uh, that uh, we cover the, uh, the waste every day at the landfills. Um, and the, the beauty of it is that it does biodegrade. Um, and it, uh, in addition, it also helps us in airspace at the landfill because now there isn't a thickness that you're covering with, but it's something that's very thin. So it, it extends the life of the landfill by using this new alternative daily cover as opposed to the green waste. Um, so now in terms of the car fuel, um, is this open to the public? Can anyone use it? What type of cars can use this fuel? And then are there plans for more gas stations? Yeah, um, the, the, gap, the CNG fueling station that you mentioned that we will be providing and um, our renewable natural gas to is definitely open to the public. Um, you know, right now, the primary customers are medium to light duty vehicles. So your Honda CNG Civics, um, your CNG light duty trucks can all fuel up there. Um, it's definitely open to the public. It's again, it's run by clean energy. Um, so we don't control the actual gas and gallon prices, but it's definitely open to the public. And again, as Basil mentioned earlier, right now, we're pretty much accepting half of our, you know, uh, rated capacity. So when and if we do get that gas, we're still, you know, taking a look at our, what our, our options are. And if there's a, a need for, you know, EV charging, which a lot of states and fleets are really pushing for full electrification, then we might have to, you know, pivot and say, hey, is this renewable natural gas more uh, needed um, to be converted into electricity to charge EV vehicle fuel leads? or if there's still a need for renewable natural gas, depending on the transportation sector, which is the largest user of renewable natural gas. So um, we're keeping our options open to see where the market's headed. Um, so those are our three different and primary uh, uh, options at this point, which is pipeline injection, more, EV, more vehicle fuel as RNG or uh, produce electricity. 
And are we working with car companies to increase the number of cars that use renewable uh, natural gas or are we just sticking to public transportation? Well, I mean, we have a pretty large fleet that we manage um, ourselves as a district, as an agency. And for all of our heavy duty trucks, we have been transitioning towards um, using uh, renewable natural gas and maybe some instances we're using biodiesel as well. Um, but again, uh, as everyone's aware, there is a, a strong push for electrification because the transportation sector really is, you know, if you look at it as, as a whole, is still responsible for a lot of our air pollutants coming from tail, pack, tail gas emissions. So <clears throat> Cal Recycle, the Cal California Air Resources Board is definitely um, not letting up on that. So we think in the next couple of years, there's still going to be a strong push for electrification. But again, until the charging infrastructure gets there until the battery technology gets there enough for you know a truck to really go uh, hundreds of miles before it needs a charge you know renewable natural gas is what we consider a bridge technology so we think that it's still going to be absolutely critical and necessary uh, for the time being maybe it's five years maybe it's ten years but it's really contingent upon how fast we can get that electrification infrastructure set up and developed and what are the prices for that? Is, is it more expensive than just regular CNG? I know it's, it's competitive. And I think if anyone wants to, I mean, all those prices at clean energy fueling stations are open to the public and it's available online. So if you just kind of search the Carson facility at Sepulveda and Figueroa, you can see what those prices are. And they're pretty, pretty um, uh, competitive. And I would say, I haven't checked recently, but it's about at the $3 range. So it's comparable to regular gasoline. Okay, great. Um, so the next question are about the fees that you charge to bring waste into the facility. Um, why do they have to pay? And since they have to pay, what do you think motivates cities or businesses to actually participate? Or how can we encourage them to take us more food waste? Second part of that question, the law is going to motivate folks to to bring the food waste or take the food waste there. Sounds like Habib wanted to add. Bedazzo, yeah, I'd, I'd also like to add that uh, we do provide an incentive at the Pony Hills MRF uh, for the haulers to bring food waste at our facility. Uh, if they uh, sign a contract with us and commit to a minimum tonnage, uh, they will get a $10 a per ton discount uh, on the tipping fee. And that uh, minimum tonnage doesn't have to be solely food waste. It could be a combination of uh, solid waste, just the regular trash. It could be the recyclables, um, so green waste. So a combination of all of that, if they bring in a minimum tonnage, they will get a discount uh, for the food waste. So we do want to encourage as much as possible um, the source separation of food waste and bringing it to the Pony Hills Murph for processing. And is food soiled paper like napkins and paper towels, food service items, like paper fiber food boats, is that accepted into this program as well? So that is considered as part of the uh, definition of organics uh, as organics. Uh, at the Pony Hills Murph, uh, we do accept uh, different soil paper and, and sometimes even other types of material, uh, knowing that uh, our equipment at the facility is fairly new. Uh, we are always open to try any type of different kinds of material, you know, depending on the amount of cardboard that it comes in or the plastics, because um, as Will and Basil had described, you know, the, the actual Dota machine does remove, uh, you know, that uh, contaminants. So we don't want to restrict anybody from not coming in if they do have any of those contaminants uh, as part of their stream. Uh, we will... Um, try it out. We will see how much uh, our equipment can remove before we uh, uh, get back to them and let them know whether that stream is acceptable or not. And Habib, while you're still here, uh, someone asked you a question directly. You talked about compostable and biodegradable, specifically that cover film that you refer to. So what, what exactly is the difference is the question. It is, it is biodegradable. So after, you know, 
after it's placed, you know, you know, trash is placed the following day, and it's part of uh, the process that takes place in a landfill. That plastic will biodegrade um, eventually. So, uh, what is that plastic film made of? To, to, to give you the specs uh, at this point in time, I, I can certainly get back to you um, and back to uh, the person that's asking exactly what that's made of, but I don't have that with me right now. Okay. Um, so the next question, we'll move on now to um, the people that work at our facility around how many people work at materials recovery facility and at the joint plant. I know at the joint plant, we have um, about 380 workers there. I just spoke to the joint plant manager the other day. So it's around 380. So how many people work at the materials recovery facility? So at the Pony Hills Murph, uh, there's approximately about uh, 30. Uh, and when I say 30, I refer to uh, districts full-time employees. Uh, we also have uh, contract labor. Um, where we have uh, an actual contract with a labor company that provides us uh, that labor. And depending on the amount of um, tonnage that comes into the facility that needs processing um, or, uh, or recovery, uh, we can increase or decrease that amount of labor. And at one point in time, we, we had you know, up to 100. So that could vary uh, depending on the season and on the year. Okay, um, a real time question. We had an earthquake last night. How did that impact work today? Were there any safety checks or was everything good? I'm gonna kick that to Habib. Yeah, so absolutely. I did contact uh, the facilities uh, surrounding the uh, El Monte area. So, uh, which is the Pony Hills landfill and the Pony Hills Murph. Um, the feedback I got that uh, it's business as usual, uh, things were checked and uh, uh, everything's going good, thank God. Great, and this is just a reminder, um, if you guys have any questions, if you can put them in the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen, that way the, the questions can be organized and we can ensure that they get answered. Um, so the next question is, is the joint plant doing the same processing as the Hyperion treatment plant of like food waste, Larry? I'm not, is Hyperion doing food waste um, processing as well? Hyperion is a city that lays wastewater treatment plant. Right. All right, they might be starting up a food waste recycling program, but our wastewater treatment plants are not, you know, they're not able to actually process any solid waste uh, by nature. So. Um, assuming that they're doing something similar to us, they would have to meet a slurry specification for co-digestion. So by the time it gets to our wastewater treatment plant, it already has to be in slurry form because uh, we're not able to process any sort of solid waste at that wastewater treatment facility. And I think Mark wants to add something. Mark, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I just want to add. So the city of LA's Hyperion plant, uh, due to the spacing at the plant and the local uh, traffic cannot do a, a project like we can do because they can't, they just are not allowed and can't physically bring in the 20 to 40 trucks a day that we have. So uh, I know they've had some pilot pro projects there, uh, but by and large, uh, they're, they're still investigating what to do uh, they have some of their franchises are doing other technologies. We may be getting some of that, but uh, Hyperion will not be a major part of their solution. And Mark, introduce yourself. Oh, hi, Mark McDaniel. I'm um, division engineer and manager of the energy recovery section at the districts. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, our next question is, so what is the ultimate goal of this project or this program? Turn, take a waste and turn it into a resource. We have a problem, we have an issue that needs to be solved. Food waste has, organic waste, food waste has to be diverted from landfills and we have the infrastructure to turn that into an energy source as well as creating um, compost. 
So it's consistent with our motto, converting waste into resource. And we're here to basically serve our member cities with this program. Anything you want to add, Will? No, that, that's it. I mean, we want to see, we want to be as much of the solution as we can. Um, so again, if we can handle up to 600, once we get there, we'll reevaluate to see if we can handle more. But again, there's uh, 4,000 tons out there that really need to be able to have, you know, have a home to go to. And that's not in the landfill. So we'll try to see as, you know, how much we can play and how much uh, of a solution we can play uh, as a role. Okay, and um, the trucks that go, that transport the slurry from the MRF to the joint plant, what are they running on? Are they running on renewable natural gas, uh, diesel, regular gas? Yeah, it depends on the fleet. Um, for our trucks that transport between the Dota and the joint plant, um, you know, they fuel up at our stations and our stations are, are utilized renewable natural gas as their fuel. Okay. Um, and how, going back to the digesters, how often do you need to clean them out? And do they it's have- about, it's, be, it's between five and six years. Uh, and we rotate between the 24. So at any given time, I think we have two that are down for, for cleaning. Um, so that gets rotated um, uh, continuously. And it takes, I, I believe, a couple of weeks or a couple of months for you know, the operational staff to get down in there to remove all the inerts, to do all the PMs and the uh, preventive maintenance and the necessary action items to make sure that it runs, you know, okay for the next five or six years again. Okay, and do you see COVID-19 impacting the hall levels of food waste from the sources used to meet our goals or to meet California's goals? Yeah, I mean, if you guys took a look at our overall trend starting in 2014, we were, you know, during the first couple of years, we were operating a demonstration project. We, you know, proved its effectiveness and achievability. And then we started, you know, ramping up. And the ramp rate was actually pretty significant. A lot of our customers started uh, fine tuning their operation on the pre processing side. And pre pandemic levels, we were, you know, receiving 350 plus uh, average tons per day. And right after the pandemic hit and basically the economy shut down middle of March, you know, we suffered uh, maybe, you know, 33% hit where we reached down to about 250 tons per day. So we saw a sizable step decrease, but, you know, you know it has slowly started creeping back up again where we're back into the 300s, but it definitely did take a toll. Yeah, they're asking if they can see the chart. Um, oh, chart again? Oh, yeah, okay. we can see the chart again. And uh, there's another question that was, what are those companies that are bringing the slurry again? So maybe that chart will help too. Same, same slide. <clears throat> uh, can you see the chart? Yeah, oh, we can see the last slide. There you okay. go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so you'll notice the dip there around April 2020. All right, should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, yeah, stop sharing. Um, all right, so how much remaining processing capacity does the Dota pre-processing pre equipment have? And how much additional material can it handle per day? Well, we're averaging about 30 right now, and the, the, the Dota machine can handle and process up to 165. So like Basil mentioned, we can, you know, quintuple the, the amount of stuff coming in and being processed. So we still have quite a bit of capacity left um, for that facility and that process. So if you guys have, you know, relatively clean SSO, reach out to Habib. Cool. Um, so then the next question is, um, are you providing energy to all of California or just LA County? But the, the power that's produced at Total Energy Facility, again, is primarily used on site to, uh, to, to fulfill all of its energy needs. And if there is any excess, we do, you know, push it out to SoCal Edison's grid, but that's, you know, just a little bit. The plant, uh, you know, for reliability purposes, always wants to be uh, a power exporter so that it can, at any time, in case something goes down, you know, it can island mode, which means that it can just completely separate from the grid and be self-reliant. 
Um, so the purpose of TEF is not to export power, but just to satisfy its own power requirements. Right now we are exporting, you know, about a meg and a half, one megawatt, 1.5 megawatts of power, but that's going to be that extra gas to generate that power is then going to be diverted over to our BCS in about a month and a half or so. So another question, Seattle requires residents to dispose of their food waste um, in a compost bin that's collected by waste management. Why don't we collect it from the residents? Or why don't we do, do something similar where we collect food waste from residents? Um, we, I think that's, that's between the cities and the haulers. Um, we collect, we take what comes to our door, Habib and Will, figure out how to put it, um, put it to use. But by law, we don't collect, or, um, we cannot collect, but we're there to manage whatever people want to bring to us, we're there to manage. So it's really a jurisdictional question. I don't know if Habib wants to add anything or Will wants to add anything. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, um, maybe, um, you know, at that state, they have facilities, composting facilities that are permitted to accept food waste with green waste. Um, so again, it really depends on the, uh, uh, the ultimate destination of where the green waste is going and what they're permitted for. Are there any other gases be besides methane and CO2 that are produced in the digestion process? For the most part, no, it's primarily CO2 and methane gas. There's trace elements of high, you know, H2S um, and that needs to be removed and in our BCS we do remove that. Um, we have other contaminants that are inherent in the gas as well, um, such as siloxanes um, and, and actually condensate. So, you know, before it can actually, before we actually consider it renewable natural gas to use as vehicle fuel, that's essentially what the biogas conditioning system is doing. It's taking the raw digester gas, which is, you know, completely, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, there's a lot of uh, liquid. Uh, that's in the gas, there's, sulf there's hydrogen sulfides and then there's also um, CO2. So the BCS essentially removes all those contaminants so that you're just left with a quality fuel at the end. Okay, so next question. Can you <clears throat> give people ways or tips on how they can reduce food waste at home? And when you look at, I mean, the first thing is not generate it. And be, I guess, I don't know. I don't eat everything. Or I said, be like Basil and eat everything. Yeah, be like me and eat everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think, yeah, portion control, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so someone says thank you. And, um, Someone else uh, around how many of these systems are all over California and in the country? I don't know about California, but there was a report uh, produced recently called Diet for a Landfill um, by what they call the civil grand jury. And in that report, it gives you a pretty good summary of the types of the similar facilities to ours. Ours is one of few. I think uh, Kroger, one of the grocery chains have a similar type operation but when you look at that report called diet for landfills or landfill diet you'll see a summary of what we have in LA County and there aren't many there aren't a lot okay um, <clears throat> uh, Will talked about the plastic waste that is removed um, in the bioseparators at the Puna Hills MRF what exactly do we do to that plastic first of all that stuff is disposed of, and Habib, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that stuff does get sent over to the landfill, the plastic film that's removed from the first and second uh, bioseparator reject bin. That is correct. And do we measure the amount of plastic that we, that we get? Or? We, we do measure um, all the contaminants that are removed um, from the food waste, so we can better determine exactly um, how much food is we are diverting uh, for our member cities. And when you, does that create microplastics when you um, grind them up in the machine? Microparticles? No, the, 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 it doesn't shred them down to, to that level of, of uh, 
of a, like a microparticle, no. Okay, Abib, while you're there, can you talk a little bit about how the member cities get credit for their food waste program? How do you uh, give them credit for what they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned, um, you know, the, the food waste comes in, it gets, um, it get weighed, uh, it gets weighed at our scales. Um, and then after we process it, uh, the contamination that comes out from the DOTA goes into bins uh, that get weighed also. So it's a very simple math. We subtract out the contaminants, um, you know, from the, from the food waste. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we can give the member cities uh, the, the diversion and, and tons uh, that we've diverted away from landfills. So they get the credit for helping to meet that the <clears throat> target. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, can you remind us again what exactly we do with those solids um, that we process? The biosolids? Yeah, um, can you remind us? Yeah, so what we do is we have about seven sites that we take it to. Either it's land applied or it's mixed with ag, ag waste and it, it's composted and we create a compost, a soil amendment that we either sell or we work with local farmers to uh, rejuvenate uh, re enriched soil. Okay, cool. Um, so the next question, I love people are, I think these are the most questions we've, like we usually receive a lot of questions, but I think today we, we broke a record. It's because of Habib and Will. Yeah, yeah. So um, the alternative daily cover that we used for landfills, was that, is that being composted somewhere else now or? What was once what we once used as the alternative daily cover for our landfills? What are we doing? Yes, yes, the green waste is being composted uh, off site. It's transported and composted off site. All right. And what is the difference in the methane that we produce in the landfills versus the methane that we produce via anaerobic digestion? None. The difference in the, the digesters is that we know none escapes to the atmosphere. Because methane is methane, but the uh, digesters are completely sealed. Okay. Um, oh, is some of the food waste slurry that's dumped into the inlet sewers at the joint plant rather than storage tanks? Is that processed with wastewater? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. So, before, so we actually just completed construction of our first slurry receiving facility, and that was a picture that you saw where there's four. Uh, 20,000 gallon storage tanks right before it goes into the digester. So between, um, you know, our demonstration project in 2014 to now, you know, the, we were sending all of our food waste slurry to what we call the LWDS, and that's short for liquid waste disposal station, liquid waste disposal station. And that basically is at the headworks of the treatment facility. So all that food waste slurry, which still needed to meet our specification, gets dumped into the headworks and it's treated just like any incoming raw sewage stream going into the JWPCP. So is the 4,000 tons per day of food waste that we, um, that we generate, Basil, is that an estimate for the state of California or the Los Angeles region? Uh, Los Angeles County, Los Angeles County, and it's an estimate. It could even be higher and you know those numbers, I mean, every, they do characterization study I think it's a conservative number. It could be even closer to 6,000 tons per day, but it's a baseline. It's a conservative estimate. Okay, and <laughs> some of the methane tanks have a sign that say hot on them. Do you know exactly what the temperature is for those methane tanks? I'm not sure of that question. Are you talking the digesters? Or? How hot is the methane that we produce? I don't know. Okay, so the next question is, <clears throat> let's see, to through. All right, so we have, do you take in meat as well? Is that part of food waste or is it solely like fruits and vegetables? Going back, I think Mark may be able to answer the question on how hot, what oh. the temperature of the methane is. Give Mark a shot. Yeah, Mark, you can unmute yourself. You're allowed to unmute yourself, Mark. So the digester itself is essentially body temperature. It's about 96 to 98 degrees F. 
if there's a sign that you saw on a digester that said hot, that's because we heat the digester with steam. So that hot warning sign is probably because there's a steam line nearby. I knew Mark would have the answer. Thank you, Mark. So, <clears throat> so we talked about the, the CO2, the food waste theory. Can I answer your other question, Genesis, about the meat? Yeah. Yes. So yes, we do. We do accept uh, meat uh, at the Pony Hills Murph. Um, just one little caveat: feathers are not really good as processing through the Dota. So <laughs> uh, just keep that in mind. <laughs> that was not a nice picture in my head. <laughs> so um, when the cars use a biofuel. Does that put any methane back into the environment? Will or Mark, I mean, basically the seal between the pump and the, the tank of the vehicle. Yeah, the answer is essentially no. Okay. <clears throat> the diff again, the difference between the digester, the entire process is sealed, no methane leaks to the environment. It's renewable fuel that's combusted completely versus a landfill or even a poorly run compost pile, the meth, some of the methane leaks to the environment. And <clears throat> so it seems like the 4,000 tons that you were talking about, Basil, it seems like that would take up a lot of space and would require a bigger facility. Um, in terms of volume, how much is that food waste condensed by the time it becomes a slurry? Uh, this is a good question because we spent like Basil was doing the math all night long, right? <laughs> well, I, well I, I guess how much volume does a food waste slurry? Um, um, so basically, uh, what it, it's that ratio. We well, could do the math. So right now, um, for every ton, uh, every hundred ton of food waste, you multiply that by uh, one point three to get uh, tons of food waste slurry. Uh, what is that volume? I'm not, I know the food waste, the 4,000 tons per day is enough to fill the Rose Bowl twice a year. So then if you multiply that by 1.3, you can see basically filling up the Rose Bowl a couple of times a year, if that helps in terms of getting a, an image of the volume of that. Does that answer your question, I hope? Yeah, I think so. And I think that um, just about answers um, all of the questions. Uh, we had a few repeats, um, but I think that, um, did you guys want? Uh, we're gonna wrap, I guess the only thing I would say is um, if um, Habib is the person to talk to, they have more capacity, it's going quickly at the Point of Hills Murph. If you wanna bring source separated food waste, this is a program this is a, the law that's in effect and enforcement will start in, a, in about a year and a half. And I mean enforcement. So it's better to, to do your, get online into our MRF now. And then if you're interested in food waste slurry, bringing it to the joint plant, Will is your man at $25 a ton. And that's the lowest rates around in terms of food waste slurry uh, handling. Um, and it's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Anything you want to plug, Genesis? You always. Um, yeah, a few things. So, one, if for some reason we did not uh, capture your question and you would, Basil, could you put up your last slide again, please? Okay. Um, so, if, if we didn't capture your question, uh, we apologize. Please send it over to us at info at lacsd.org. So, It'll come up. There you go. Info at lacsd.org and I'll put it in the chat. Um, also, if you're interested in uh, in one of these tours with your colleagues, feel free to also contact us at info at lacsd.org and we would more, we're more than happy to set up a tour for you and your colleagues. Um, and then the other thing, oh, um, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, this video is, will be posted on YouTube. So we should have it up by like Monday, <clears throat> depending how hard it is to, to edit Basil. <laughs> <laughs> to make me sound. Um... Make him sound smarter. 
<clears throat> so no, so we're gonna post it on YouTube. So be on the lookout. We'll we'll post it on our social media channels once it's up and ready, or you can just check. You can go to youtube.com. Our um, username is Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. So if you do a quick search, you'll see that nice, beautiful logo up at the top left hand, and that's how you know it's 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 our account. And, and Will and Abib are also available if, if they want the same virtual tour for a city staff or someone, a hauler, they're willing, we can do this again for a select group of haulers or cities who may have missed this or um, wanted to be able to interact with Will and Abib and Mark and all the folks that know everything you'd ever want to know about this program. We're there to, to help solve the problem, as Will said.